All right, good afternoon. Um, few, uh, senior personnel appointment I want to start with, and then some new resident coordinators. Uh, the Secretary General is appointing today Bintu Keita of Guinea as his special representative in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. She will head up the UN Organization and st uh, Stabilization Mission, better known as MONUSCO. <clears throat> Ms. Keita succeeds Leila Zarugi of Algeria, who will complete her assignment next month. The Secretary General is deeply grateful to Ms. Zarugi for her important contribution service to MONUSCO. Ms. Keita brings to the position more than 30 years of experience in peace, security, development, humanitarian and human rights, working in conflict with post and post-conflicts environments. Much more in her bio, um, her bio which has been sent. Uh, we congratulate our friend uh, Bintu for this uh, very important uh, assignment and also express our thanks to Leila Zarugi who uh, we've worked with here quite a bit and, who, and whose work we appreciated deeply. Uh, our colleagues in the UN Development Coordination Office tell us that we have three new UN resident coordinators in Benin, Egypt, and Nepal. The Secretary General has appointed uh, Salvatore Nyonzima of Burundi to serve in Benin. Elena Panova of Bulgaria will lead the UN team in Egypt. And Sarah Beslov Nyanti of Liberia will head the UN office in Nepal. This follows confirmation with the respective host governments. As you know, the resident coordinators are the Secretary General's designated representatives for development at the country level. They lead UN teams in supporting countries to respond to and recover better from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we remain uh, happily with full gender parity and north-south balance among all our resident coordinators who cover 162 countries and territories around the world. In a statement we issued last night, the Secretary General strongly um, condemn yesterday's attack by unidentified armed combatants against a UN convoy in the Timbuktu region of Mali. And this morning, we have learned from the mission that sadly a fourth Ivoirian peacekeeper has died from his injuries overnight in Bamako. Five peacekeepers were injured in the attack. Three of them are being evacuated to Dakar for further medical treatment. The Secretary General expresses his deep condolences to the bereaved families as well as the people and government of Cote d'Ivoire. He wishes a speedy and full recovery to the injured peacekeepers. The Secretary General said that attacks against UN peacekeepers may constitute war crimes. He calls on the Malian authorities to spare no effort in identifying and promptly bringing to justice the perpetrators of this heinous attack. The Secretary General reaffirms the solidarity of the United Nations with the people and government of Mali. And an update uh, from the Central African Republic following yesterday's attack by armed combatants near the capital, Bangui, that, as you will recall, left one peacekeeper uh, killed and another injured. The UN mission in the country has conducted additional operations on the outskirts of Bangui in coordination with national defense and security forces. Dozens of weapons, including uh, rocket-propelled grenades, machine guns, ammunition, magazines, radio chargers, telephones, and some military uniforms were seized from armed groups. Uh, the mission said that this operation further prevented armed groups from ma marching to the capital with a view of destabilizing national institutions. Our colleagues report that today the situation in the capital and the countryside remain calm but unpredictable. The UN mission also announced that it will assist Central African authorities, including by providing security to facilitate the reopening of the Bangui Douala axis, and Douala uh, being in Cameroon, of course, uh, which is currently due, uh, closed due, of course, as you can imagine, to issues of insecurity. This supply road uh, is essential to ensure continued availability of food and other provisions in the Central African Republic. Back here, or virtually here, the Mark Lokok, our emergency relief coordinator, told Security Council members that the most urgent priority in Yemen right now is to prevent a massive famine, with the data showing that 16 million people will go hungry this year. Although he warned about 50,000 people are essentially starving to death in what is essentially a small famine. He noted that on Sunday, the U.S. announced it will designate, it, it will designate Ansar Allah as a specially designated terrorist entity and foreign terrorist organization under U.S. domestic law. Mr. Lokok said that agencies have unanimous, UN, that 
aid agencies have unanimously opposed this designation because they believe it will accelerate Yemen's slide into large-scale famine. And he said that Yemeni families are terrified that no more food or other supplies will now make it into the country. Martin Griffiths, the special envoy for Yemen, also expressed his concerns about the designation, adding that his fear that there will be inevitably a chilling effect on the efforts to bring the parties together. He also warned that the recent attacks in Aden Airport cast a shadow over what should have been a moment of hope in the efforts of, to bring peace to Yemen. The special envoy added that we need to maintain our focus and that the parties are the primary goal, which is to resume an inclusive political process designed to compre comprehensively end conflict. Also briefing was David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program, and he said that 11 million people in Yemen are already at crisis level for hunger, whom 5 million people are at an emergency level. With the U.S. designation, he said, the situation will be catastrophic. And regarding Libya, uh, I think one of you was asking me an update on Libya. The Advisory Committee for the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum continued its deliberations in Geneva for a second day. We're encouraged by the seriousness of the discussions and the commitments of its members who are working long hours with the active facilitation of the UN uh, mission to agree on a common proposal for the selection mechanism of a unified executive authority in line with the Tunis roadmap. Speaking of Tunis, um, I wanted to say in response to a couple of questions I got asking about Tunisia that the Secretary General congratulates the Tunisian people and their leaders on the 10th anniversary of the January 14th revolution. In the years since, Tunisia has achieved significant progress in consolidating democracy and promoting socioeconomic development. The Secretary General encourages the Tunisian people to further advance democratic reforms, build, on, build consensus on national development priorities, promote dialogue to address inequalities that have increased following the COVID-19 pandemic, reiterate the firm commitment of the UN, he reiterates the firm commitment of the United Nations to support an inclusive democratic process that meets the aspirations of all Tunisians. And uh, turning to Ethiopia, um, the High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said today he continues to be extremely troubled by the plight of civilians, particularly Eritrean refugees. He said while there's been some positive recent developments, he, remained, he and uh, UNHCR and its partners have not had access to the Shimbela and Hitsats refugee camps, stressing that e Eritrean refugees in these camps have been without aid for many weeks. The agency is also distressed that it is unable to help the thousands of Eritrean refugees who continue to flee camps in search of safety. They, some of these refugees have arrived by foot uh, in the town of Shire in Tigray and are emaciated and begging for aid that is just not available. Mr. Grandi said that refugees who reach Addis are being returned to Tigray, some against their will. He reiterated the UN-wide call for full and unimpeded access and for exploring all options to safety, providing desperately needed assistance. And in a new report released today by the UN Environment Program, they warn that if countries don't step up uh, their actions to adapt to a new climate reality, they will face serious costs and damages and losses. The UNEP Adaptation Gap Report found that while nations have advanced in planning, huge gaps remain in finance for developing countries to get adaptation projects to the stage where they can bring real projection against climate uh, impacts such as droughts, flood, and sea level rise. Almost three quarters of nations have some adaptation plans in peace, but financing and implementation fall far short of what is needed. Annual adaptation costs in developing countries are estimated at 70 billion dollars. This figure is expected to reach 140 to 300 billion dollars in 2030 and up to 50 billion dollars, excuse me, and up to 500 billion dollars in 2050. More information on UNEP. And Brendan is not here today, uh, but he has asked me uh, to give you the following message, is that his boss, uh, the President of the General Assembly, Volkan Boskir, uh, will be uh, holding his press conference at 11 a.m. tomorrow in this very room. 
and that at noon I will be joined by guests from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, John Wilmoth, who you know well, the Director of the Population Division, um, and also Claire Mizzoni, the, popu uh, Mizzoni, the Population Affairs Officer, will join us virtually. They will discuss the release of the International Migration 2020 Highlights uh, Report. Um, I'm in your hands. Edie. Thank you, Steph. Um, three top uh, UN officials dealing with Yemen today, Martin Griffiths, Mark Lowcock, and David Beasley, all called on the United States to reverse its designation of the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Does the, Uni does the Secretary General also support this call? Of course. Uh, I mean, they, they speak on his behalf on Yemen, on issues of humanitarian, on political issues. Uh, I think we have spoken uh, from this podium, I think, uh, I can't remember what day it is, on Monday, uh, or whenever, whenever the designation happened, expressing our, our concern um, about the decision and the impact they will have. I think what you heard today uh, was not only very passionate remarks, but very detailed remarks about the consequences of, um, of what the designation could have on the people of Yemen. Thank you. Um, I have one follow-up question on Libya. Mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, time frame on when we might hear about uh, a new SRSG? Next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope, all joking aside, I very much hope uh, soon, um, first and foremost, so you stop asking me about it, uh, but that we have some clarity. Uh, though, obviously, as, as you can see, uh, under Ms. Williams' leadership, um, the mission has been doing a tremendous amount of work. Uh, let's go to who I'm told to go to. Uh, Michelle Nichols, and then we'll, Michelle? Hi, Steph, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Uh, a follow-on from Edie's question. Uh, what conversations has the Secretary General had with anyone in the U.S. administration about the Houthi designation? Um, and just a second separate question on Cameroon, any reaction to the weekend attack? Thanks. Look, uh... We've, we've seen uh, repeated cases of violence uh, in Cameroon, uh, which, are very, uh, which are very disturbing. Uh, I think it is important um, that there is, um, uh, that there is uh, the proper dialogue uh, between all the parties uh, to get, um, to find a way out of this uh, violence and this suffering. Uh, on your first question, um, nothing that I'm able to share with you. Obviously, contacts have been had at various uh, levels. Uh, Mr. Reinel. Hi, Steph. Um, good morning. I've got a few questions. Um, another one on this, um, the U.S. designation of the Houthis. Obviously, that designation as terrorist organization comes into effect on the 19th, the day before the administration changeover. So all these comments we're hearing from all these UN officials, including the SG, um, are, are they messages that you feel that the successor administration should be cognizant of also? Uh, these uh, appeals are being made uh, in public. I have no doubt uh, they're being heard. Your other question. Um, yeah, yesterday you told us that with the Ugandan elections that you guys will be keeping a close eye on this. Um, is there any update you can give us today? Um, and is your ability to keep an eye on things being impaired by the internet blackout over the landlocked African country? No, I have, listen, I have no, uh, no reports from the, from the field. We should probably have something either later today or early uh, tomorrow. I mean, we have folks uh, on the ground. I've not heard that we're being, uh, that it has impacted our, our work in any way, though I, it is important to stress that we are not 
official monitors with a big M, but obviously we would be uh, in the country and we're keeping an eye on the, uh, on the process. Um, let's go to... Um, Sorry, can I do one more step? Yes, you may. Thanks so much. Uh, you got asked by Edie a minute ago um, about the Libya envoy. You get asked about it loads. Every time we ask you, you kind of say the same thing. You can't say the answer right now. And then you say, what a great job Stephanie Williams is doing. Why not just give her the job? Well, <laughs> there is a process uh, ongoing, but I will take your recommendation and send it to those people who are making the choices. Um, Ibtissam and then Rick Gladstone. Hi, Isaac, thank you. Um, to question on Yemen, uh, Mr. Lukak uh, talked, and I think you read uh, part of his statement, about 50,000 people are essentially uh, starving uh, to death in what is essentially a small famine. Could you say more uh, on that? What does that exactly mean? Are, are you talking about you are expecting 50,000 people to, to die if things not change, or what exactly? I mean, these are people who are in, uh, in very grave uh, in very grave conditions. Uh, it's, I, I think I, I would just urge you to go back and look, look at what he said and look at what, uh, and he listened to what Beasley said. If you have more granular questions on numbers, uh, then we'll get those answers uh, to you. Uh, Mr. Gladstone. Uh, I, I have, I oh, have another one. Oh, please, please, go ahead, uh, sorry. Uh, so the, the British ambassador uh, regarding the attacks on Adan, it, she talked about um, she welcomed the UN panel of uh, experts investigating into uh, the incident. Uh, could you say more on that, Fan? Uh, well, the, the panel of experts uh, work uh, separately from the, uh, from the Secretary General. I'm sure they will report in due time uh, to the Security Council, uh, the relevant Security Council committee. Uh, Mr. Gladstone. Hello, Steph. Thank you very much. Uh, I also have a question about Yemen. Um, and forgive me if I, this is news has been covered and I missed it, but how does the um, U.S. Uh, designation of the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization complicate at all, if anything, the um, the effort to salvage uh, uh, the, the, the safer oil tanker and avert an uh, environmental disaster there. And maybe you can just tell us what progress, if any, has been made since since the uh, Houthis uh, said that they would allow a U.N. inspection team to go aboard the ship. It's a very good question, Rick. Uh, as of as what we've been told a few days ago is that we're still and this was before the designation, looking for a February um, uh, February date, early February, for the arrival of, of the first team. Um, overall, our concern, uh, one of our many concerns with the designation is the impact it would have on the commercial imports uh, and, and the private sector in Yemen, given that Yemen uh, overwhelmingly uh, even in, in better times, uh, relies on, on the private sector for food importation. And we were afraid that cer certain parts of the private sector may not want to uh, deal with getting the, um, uh, the waivers and the extra paperwork and the real danger of coming across uh, and violating U.S. Uh, sanctions. What direct impact it will have on the SAFR oil tanker operations and the private sector companies the UN is dealing with? Uh, it's a very pointed question. Let me make a call right after and see uh, if that's if if there is any any impact uh, on that. Okay, um, uh, Stefano. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, same question of yesterday about Mario Paciola. That it's been six months since his death and uh, the investigation. You told me yesterday that you were going to look and, uh, and, and tell me something. How long we had to wait for the UN conclusion on this? Stuff? Look, the, the UN is working with the relevant authorities in Colombia, 
in Italy who have uh, the primary responsibility for this uh, criminal investigation. Uh, and we are continuing to, to work with them, making uh, information available to them. And that's what, that's what I can tell you. Uh, Just a quick follow-up, yeah. because the Colombian, they came up with the conclusion for the Colombian is a suicide. For the Italians, is not yet. So that's why everybody's waiting for the UN to come up with its con own conclusion. So at least that we can, uh, you know, this could help. All right, as soon as I have anything more, I will share it with you. Uh, I was also asked about the latest uh, reports that Iran was increasing its uh, production of uranium uh, metal. And all I can say is, which I think what I said yesterday, is that we would encourage Iran to abide by its IAEA um, uh, responsibilities. Um, and uh, that's it, unless there are other questions. Thank you all. See you tomorrow, 11 o'clock for the PGA and 12 if you still have the energy for me.